Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. We bring you compliments and greetings from the Middle East and North Africa region. And it's a pleasure to be able to join this uh, global symposium. Um, we will be looking at the importance of uh, the Montevideo Program 5 in advancing environmental rule of law in the Middle East and North Africa region. And it's my greatest pleasure to chair this session. I am Professor Damilola Olawi, a professor at the Ahmad bin Khalifa University, the College of Law in Doha, Qatar. It's my pleasure to be able to welcome four very distinguished scholars and practitioners that represent the very best in terms of advancing the rule of law and environmental implementation in our region. Um, first, we are going to be able to hear from Dr. Christina Abi Eda, an environmental lawyer and adjunct faculty at the Lebanese American University in Lebanon. She has practiced extensively in the field. She has more than a decade of experience and she's worked extensively as a senior legal advisor to several EU, UNDP and USAID uh, projects. She's also served as partner for legal and PPP design um, in the Progress platform. So you will hear from her shortly as she will be speaking on developing adequate and effective environmental legislation and legal frameworks in the MENA region through the UNEP Montevideo program. Second, after that, you will hear from our very distinguished professor, Professor Riyad Fakri, um, who is a professor of environmental law at the University of Hassan, Hassan II Setat in Morocco, and also a legal counsel to the Minister of Health in Oman. He will be speaking on strengthening the effective implementation of environmental law in the MENA region, um, with focus on the opportunities from the UNEP Montevideo program. Professor Riyad Falkri is the vice chair of the Association of Environmental Law Lecturers in the Middle East and North Africa region. In addition, he serves as the director of the Business Law Research Laboratory at the Hassan One University of Setat in the Kingdom of Morocco. And he has published extensively in this field. He has participated in enormous conferences in the field. And we hope to hear from him uh, in terms of the perspectives from the Maghreb region uh, of the MENA region. And Todd, after that, we will be able to get some practitioner perspectives. And we are very delighted today to be able to welcome one of the uh, foremost arbitrators and practitioners in the entire MENA region. Dr. Mahmoud Hussein, who is joining us from the United Arab Emirates. He is the founding partner of Mahmoud Hussein Law Firm, which is in the Business Bay in, in the UAE. Uh, he, he has over 20 years of experience in public and private sectors. He has served as litigator at Dubai courts. He has been able to receive favorable judgments in several high profile cases. And he has carved a niche for himself as one of the most uh, influential arbitrators, especially when it comes to climate change related disputes. He has served as a member of the International Chamber of Commerce Tax Force on arbitration of climate change related disputes. And is currently serving as a member of another ICC task force on addressing the issues of corruption in international arbitration. Um, he's done a lot of things in arbitration, he's published uh, uh, books, it's published articles on, on it as well. And um, he, he is also an adjunct professor at the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom, where he has taught uh, different courses on the law and practice of Sharia arbitration. And we're delighted that Dr. Uzain will be speaking to us today about access to environmental justice in the MENA region, focusing on the topical issue of the important roles of arbitration and how the UNEP Montevideo, how the United Nations Montevideo program can assist with integrating arbitration as a timely, efficient, and important tool for advancing environmental dispute resolution in the MENA region. That, that's a very important topic, and we all look forward to hearing from Dr. Hussein. Last, but certainly not the least, will be Dr. Aziza Monier, um, who is a senior lecturer uh, at the Suez Canal University in Egypt. 
she is also a member of the governing council of the association of environmental law lecturers in the middle east and north africa region and she holds a phd in environmental politics from the freeburg university in germany she served as a visiting scholar in vienna austria and she's uh, uh, served as a visiting research fellow in Uppsala, sweden she's recently completed a visiting fellowship at the new Hampshire university in the united states of america and she's worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the American University in Cairo, Egypt as well. She's published extensively on, on, on issues relating to environmental justice, environmental movement, access, uh, environmental awareness, environmental communication, and the role of international policies in terms of advancing empowerment at the local level. And of course, fittingly, she will be speaking to us today about the important roles of the Montevideo program in enhancing capacity building and awareness for increased effectiveness of environmental law in the MENA region. So it's, it's a very rich panel. We'll start with uh, law, we'll go to institutions, we'll then talk about dispute resolution, and then we'll talk about public participation and empowerment. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the MENA region. And without much ado, let me immediately pass the mic to our first speaker, Dr. Christina Abiheda from Lebanon. Over to you. Thank you, Professor Demilula. It's a pleasure to be among you. It's a pleasure uh, that I'm participating in this very important uh, workshop. It's uh, really, I'm very happy. Um, my topic is like how to assist countries, or who, how MENA countries can develop adequate, effective environmental legislation and legal frameworks at all levels to address environmental issues. The MENA country or all the MENA region in general faces a wide array of environmental stresses that includes numerous environmental challenges such as water scarcity, arable depletion, air pollution, inadequate waste management, loss of biodiversity, declining marine resources, degradation of coastal ecosystems, and suffer from lack of energy, sustainable energy. So further development scenarios are expected to excavate these challenges. With time, these are becoming more hectic and the challenges are becoming more problematic, especially given that the MENA is one of the regions that is considered as most vulnerable to the impacts of climate. Rising temperatures and extended periods of drought combined with growing populations, socioeconomic development and urbanization huge demand on electricity, all together put further stress and pressure and pressure on environmental issues, posing scenarios and serious threats to lives, livelihoods, biodiversity, economic stability, and human security. Despite their diversified characteristics in geography, natural resources, political and social structures, and income levels, all MENA countries share a common context of critical environmental challenges and transboundary conflicts that threaten the long-term stability of the region. And most of the MENA region are increasingly aware and committed to address these climate stressors, but until now, implementation is considered still weak and no collective measures are taken into this respect. Given the variation and endowments of natural resources and socioeconomic conditions, MENA countries can take advantage of their shared culture, language sometimes, and religion to find collective solutions in addressing regional climate and environmental issues. So collectively, things may be less hectic, may find solutions, and may assist each other. So what is needed? They need to promote sustainable development and governments in these MENA countries will need to form coherent cross-sectoral policies through assessing their weaknesses and their strengths, as well as external threats through conducting this SWOT analysis to their internal regulations and laws. To highlight the threats and opportunities through benchmarking other experiences in MENA countries legislation. With respect, in, uh, uh, specifically to environmental legislation in, in general, and in particular when it comes to agriculture, energy, economy, trade, industrial, 
All this will help improve natural resources management and governance. <clears throat> so collectively, this should be done. This is an exercise that should be done individually at each MENA country in order for them to highlight with, where are the weaknesses, the strengths, what are the gaps, what are the uh, uh, needs by doing this benchmark analysis in comparison with other MENA region countries. MENA governments, this is very important. They should realize that it is the time to act now. It's now or never. Each time this delay is taking place, things are becoming more complicated and not easy to address. So realizing that the time is to act now, this means being on the front line of climate change issues. Countries in the MENA should realize that the issue must be addressed urgently and there is no time to waste. MENA governments should embark on immediate actions. So this means that regional governments have created momentum in addressing climate change in terms of both mitigation and adaptation. However, that momentum has largely evolved around establishing initiatives and targets without necessarily linking them to policies, regulations, and actions. So implementation is equally as important as putting a legislation in place. So regional states should move beyond establishing targets into taking actions now. Third, MENA governments should enable local innovations and solutions, and this is very important. So despite the growing interest in addressing climate change issues and environmental issues, most of the technology and know-how needed to do so is imported. While useful these imports are, it is very important that each country should design for their region what is needed, needed typically and suited for their local conditions. So MENA regions need to take advantage of their large youth populations and enable a national innovation system to ensure that technologies and skills meet local needs and priorities. Regional states should nurture existing institutions like universities, NGOs, entities, to enhance technologies, innovation, improve scientific competence and skills, and support the spread of know-how among relevant stakeholders. Last but not least, MENA governments should work collectively together. Some MENA countries have shared geographics and geographies and natural resources, including shared water resources, boundaries, marine environments, coastal ecosystems, and agricultural lands. Therefore, climate and environmental issues and their impact are likely to be felt across border. And if not properly managed, this could lead to conflicts or insecurity among uh, uh, unitized countries. Addressing environmental challenges should therefore involve transboundary responses. Given their differences in income and development, MENA countries can take advantage of regional governance and cooperation, especially in the areas of pollination, understanding, research and knowledge, and information sharing, technical assistance, capacity building, and leveraging financing. And this is very important. The reorganization broadly needed to achieve integrated environmental management in the MENA countries would require institutional and regulatory reforms long-term investment, efficient governance, regional cooperation for concentrated efforts, and the involvement of all required stakeholders. So three key principles should be embedded in national environmental laws in order to align them with the environment commitments. One, good governance, and this is very important. Good governments should operate in an inclusive and accountable manner, open to all stakeholders at multiple levels of scale. So good governance and transparency are the first key to establish good legislations. 
and good environmental laws and regulations. Second, the second key principle is health, wealth, and well-being for all. Decisions about the environment should contribute to social and economic infrastructure, wealth creation, well-being, and poverty alleviation so that no one is left behind, in particular women, children, vulnerable, vulnerable people, and other marginalized groups. The third key principle, in order that it should be embedded in the environmental legislations, it is to maintain or enhance, and this is case by case, maintain or enhance the environment and nature resources. All decisions making must recognize that the environment, including the ecosystems, is a foundation and an important pillar on which human health, wealth, and well being are built. So, decisions must account for and maintain the full range of values and benefits provided by the environment and natural resources. So, I was able to demonstrate what were the most important initiatives that should be taken by MENA governments? What are the main three key principles that should be embedded into the legislation of uh, uh, environment? How to enhance the, the, the environmental laws and all the derivatives that are related to environmental legislation? The main question now arise, how UNEP and the UNEP Montevideo program can assist to reach this ultimate goal. The role of the Montevideo program is very important, but it is important to highlight that there is no single best practice approach to environmental lawmaking for sustainable development. So this means that if a law is good and suitable for a country, it's not efficient and useful to copy paste it to another country as it is. It should be evolved as per the criteria and as per the circumstances of this specific country. So this means that there is no single best practice that could be uh, replicated when it comes to environment lawmaking for sustainable development. The task is considered how complex circumstances, cutting across different policies, institutions, sectors, and the matter of the geography and the existing. However, experiences from around the MENA countries do highlight characteristics, ingredients of effective environmental law and lawmaking. And here comes the role of the UNEP Montevideo program. Through ensuring that member states are using the Law Environment Assistance Platform, the UNEP PlayUp, which is the Montevideo Environmental Law Program Digital Backbone. Through close monitoring on digital access and follow up. So here, it, they should make sure that all countries, member states are having direct access, are accessing it regularly. Where member states can directly request support from UNEP and partners via the clearinghouse mechanism within the technical assistance section, and this is very useful and helpful. Likewise, they can use the knowledge base and country profile sections to access relevant environment news, legislations, jurisprudence, model laws, legislative toolkits, and other environmental law guidance, products, and resources. And this would be helpful to conduct the SWOT benchmarking environmental law analysis that I have stated previously. Second role of the UNEP Montevideo program is to conduct more regular meetings for designated national focal points. And here it is very important to note that sometimes a country designate a focal point and they are there forever and they are sometimes not active and they are sometimes not relevant to the program. And here comes the role of the UNEP Montevideo program to assess and to ensure this kind of a continuous reshuffle between uh, share uh, between the focal points, enabling them to know each other, interact more in order to ensure exchange of information and building capacity of one another. 
Now it's very easy after the pandemic, virtual meetings became a very common practice. So let's take advantage of this and bring countries together at focal points to share their experiences, share their problems in order to find uh, uh, solutions uh, uh, collectively. Third way how the UNEP Montevideo program can play a role is through raising awareness, through focus on country states bilaterally to ensure that they are promoting the development and implementation of environmental rule of law as per the environmental dimension of the 2030 agenda. Assisting more governments in obtaining environmental information for decision making and providing citizens with greater access to information pertaining to their environmental rights, enhancing, and here comes a big role for the UNEP Montevideo program, where they can enhance each country to enhance their co uh, uh, environmental cooperation at the global and regional levels, developing and applying national and international environmental law, prom promoting, protecting, and respecting environmental rights and encouraging links between civil society and governments in the development and implementation of the environment. I would like to end by thanking the UNEP and the Montevideo program for giving me the chance to be among you. It's, I'm very delighted and it's very important to have this kind of 24 hour of environmental law discussion to share knowledge. And this is by itself a big, big, huge milestone among MENA region countries. Thank you, everybody. And I'm open to any question if you. Thank you very much, Dr. Christina, for that very detailed and um, important and insightful presentation. I think you've, you've stated very clearly that the Montevideo program has helped to place environmental considerations squarely at the heart of decision making at all levels in the MENA region. Beyond what we had before, there is now increased environmental awareness. Environmental issues are now discussed at all levels, including at governmental levels, which is very, very good. And, I, and you identified some essential principles for advancing that impact, for ensuring that progress made can be sustained, So, which, which are really, really essential uh, principles that I'm sure other speakers will move forward uh, as well. Um, for our uh, listeners, if you have questions, please type them into the, the chat box and I would uh, read them uh, at the end of the presentation so we can uh, have a, a very uh, robust uh, discussion afterwards. So let's, without uh, much ado, let's move to the next uh, presentation. I'll call on uh, Professor uh, Riyad Fakri, who will be talking about the essential framework for strengthening the effective implementation of some of the laws and principles that uh, Dr. Christina has talked about. Over to you. Uh, thank you, my friend. Uh, first of all, uh, allow me and on behalf of my colleagues from the International Association of uh, Environmental Lecturers from many countries to express my thanks to the United Nations and its environment program for involving, uh, involving our association in the organization of this event, and also for inviting me to participate in this symposium organized on the occasion of the 40th anniversary uh, of the Montevideo program and 50 years of international environmental law. What I'm trying uh, or going to present to you today is the process and the adventures of becoming a partner of the environmental law program in Montevideo, and especially how can this program uh, help the framework system uh, in the Maghreb uh, countries uh, to develop? So the question uh, is how to strengthen the effective implementation of environmental law at the national level and how the UNEP Montevideo program can assist uh, uh, with this. Firstly, to answer this question, uh, I think we have to talk briefly about the importance of the Montevideo environmental law program and what, it's, uh, what it gives. As you know, 
uh, Montevideo Environmental Law Program uh, will support the development of uh, adequate and effective environmental legislation and legal frameworks at all levels to address environmental issues, strengthen the effective implementation of environmental law at the national level, support enhanced capacity building for increased effectiveness of environmental law for all uh, stakeholders and at all levels, uh, support national governments, you open their request, of course, in the development uh, and implementation of uh, environmental role uh, of law. And finally, pr promote the role of environmental law in the context of environmental uh, governance. Secondly, the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, implements the program in partnership with national focal points, a steering committee for implementation and other partners and stakeholders. Implementation will be in accordance with the objective, strategic activities, and implementation guidelines set out in the program. The countries of the Maghreb have contributed to the activation of the United Nations Environment Program at the regional level as members. It has also helped in the development of international environmental law through its participation in the activities of the Montevideo Focal Points Environmental Law Program. Today, uh, Mauritania and Algeria have national focal points for Montevideo Environment Law Program. But as for Morocco and Tunisia, unfortunately, no appoint, appointment yet. So the Maghreb uh, focal points, if there is, will support efforts to liaise and collaborate among other governments, officials and the key stakeholders at all relevant levels appropriate to the implementation of activities under Montevideo Environmental Law Program. She will also participate in the biennial, global and other relevant meeting of the national focal points which will be held, uh, held face to face or remotely as appropriate. Provide strategic advice, guidance and direction to UNEP in the delivery of Montevideo environmental law program. And finally contribute to uh, catalyzing action to address emerging uh, uh, environmental issue uh, through the law. For example, Morocco relied on a set of national environment program like the National Air Program, the National Liquid Dysfunction Program, the National Waste Valuation Program, the National Program for the Management of Household Waste, which aims to strengthening and expanding the national air quality monitoring network, reducing the emission of gases emissions from the transport and industrial sectors, strengthening the legal framework in the field of air pollution resulting from the transport and industrial sectors, strengthening communication and awareness of air pollution. And if we try to find out the Maghreb's legal system, we will find that uh, Morocco's legal system has more than 200 30 legal provisions on environmental protection, such as law about national charter for environment uh, and sustainable development, uh, a law about forest conservation and exploitation, water law, and the law on environmental uh, protection and rehabilitation, a law about combating air pollution, law about waste management and disposal, law about environmental assessment, and a uh, law about pastoral travel and the development and management of pastoral areas and forest uh, pastoral and other uh, uh, laws. In Tunisia, uh, the Tunisian's legal system has multiple legal provisions on environmental uh, protection, such as uh, the law uh, relating to the public maritime domain, the law relating to the conservation of water and soil, uh, law about the urgent national action plan 
to combat marine pollution incidents and the law uh, relating to waste control of uh, disposal and the implementation texts for its impl uh, implementation. And finally, a law about uh, the air quality and uh, of course, other uh, laws. In Mauritania, the Mauritanian's legal also uh, has multiple legal provisions on environmental uh, protection. Some example uh, like environmental law in uh, 2000 year, uh, the hunting and the management of wild animals law, the water law, uh, the law relating to the illegal trad in uh, endangered wild animal and uh, plan uh, specific. And the law uh, related to combating air pollution and uh, a law uh, about prohibiting the imports, manufacture, marketing, and use of flexible uh, plastic uh, bag and uh, warp. Finally, in Algeria, uh, also uh, uh, the legal system has multiple legal provisions on environmental uh, law, such as the law relating to waste management control and remove, uh, uh, the, uh, the law relating to the protection and valorization of the coast, the law about the protection of the environment within the framework of sustainable development, a law about the protection of Mediterranean areas within the framework of sustainable development, a law related to the prevention of major risks and the management of disasters within the framework of sustainable development, and finally, a law about the management, protection, and development of green uh, space. As a conclusion, uh, we see the disparation, multiplicity, and diversity of legal texts may sometimes lead to contradiction and uh, therefore difficulty in application. Enforcement texts are one of the most important obstacles to the activation of legal texts related to the environment. Some laws require more than 20 enforcement taxes, which limits the effectiveness of these taxes. And the absence of a coherent and appropriate legal framework for the reality of environmental protection in Maghreb Arab countries and in the level of each country. And finally, uh, uh, as also a global conclusion, in order to promote the application of the Montevideo program and to monitor and evaluate its implementation, as well as to support the United Nations Environment Program in its activities in the field of environmental law, we are further recommended that appropriate measures be taken, which may include uh, inviting member states to establish a network of national uh, focal points for the exchange of uh, competencies and capacity building in the various program areas, as well as to establish a regionally uh, balanced uh, mechanism such as a steering committee uh, supported by eminent legal experts in the field of environmental law with the aim of uh, uh, facilitating the implementation uh, monitoring and uh, evaluation of the Montevideo program. Thank you very much, Witten, of course, for your question, if uh, there is. Thank you very much, Professor Riyad Fakri, for that very detailed and insightful presentation. I think you've, uh, you've talked a lot about the fact that in the region, due to the Montevideo and other UNEP efforts, in the region, we have a wide range of laws that now exist on issues of air pollution, land management, water pollution, and the like. So the laws are developing, they are evolving very widely. But you, you identified a key problem that seems to end our implementation, which is the problem of duplication. There seems to be a wide range of legal frameworks that have been noticed in different parts of the region that talk about different things uh, and may, may lead to implementation challenges, such as multiplication of, of, uh, of the requirements, role overlap and and so you 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 very much touched on this issue of the need for coherence which which uh, a lot of uh, scholars have identified as well that 
um, there is a need to now create that coordination mechanism that will ensure that the different efforts that are going on in different sectors are not indeed overlapping and there's a you know and we can achieve we can reduce fragmentation and achieve greater coherence um you, you mentioned the need for a working group of some sort at the national levels that can bring together all the different activities and i and i'm sure that's that's uh, an important point that some of our uh, listeners will want to uh, build on as we go to the uh, question and answer session uh, later so we'll come back to that thank you very much once again professor uh, fakri Yes, let's move to access to environmental justice. Um, and and, and we, we welcome Dr. Mahmoud Hussein to speak to us about the important role of arbitration as a tool for dispute resolution in the environmental field. Over to you, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I'd like to build on what my colleague, uh, Dr. Riyadh, has said about there is. I agree with Dr. Riyadh, there is a growing loss the framework is enhancing because of Montevideo 5 and other United Nations effort on that regard. However, from my perspective, and I would be always asked some questions, uh, why there is no improvement and more litigate arbitration related issue goes to uh, litigation and don't go to arbitration. So basically, I'll try to address these issues from two important elements. One is substantive law, and other one is from procedural rule relating to arbitration. And how, if we improve those procedural and substantive law will enhance implementation of Montevideo 5 program. Usually from my perspective, environmental law dispute can be complex and controversial to reserve due to the wide ranging impact and interest of individuals and community. So that it may generally involve vast ranging of variety of parties from private individual to public or various community community within its scope and can stretch to multiple jurisdiction so it's a very complex from my perspective as a litigator and arbitrator who sit in tribunal because i sit in some arbitral tribunal whether it was icc and all of that but it was very challenging for me as a tribunal member and as a council as well at at the oldest, I would say it's interesting to highlight that environmental protection dispute, as I said, it is, thus, it is settled usually by litigation. Now, during my work at ICC task force on resolving climate change related dispute through arbitration, how uh, the challenging thing was for us to define, define what is really a, a climate uh, defined climate change related dispute. What is this dispute? At the end, after a very big and long debate, we came to the following um, 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 uh, definition. It is dispute arising out of or relation to the effect of climate change and climate change policy. The United Nations from Framework Convention on Climate Change and Paris Agreement. This is what the only definition, definition we were able to agree by the participant. Now, I would like first to start with a procedural challenge, then I would come to the substantive. The procedural challenge, challenge will illustrate why people are not going to arbitration. The first procedural challenge from my perspective and from my experience is recourse to appropriate scientific and other expertise. There is no ability to ensure appropriate expertise is available to the parties and qualified arbitral tribunal who has the most important for, for arbitration this expertise can achieve through appointing arbitrator with appropriate relevant experience the use of of party tri tribunal expert as well so basically what i'm trying to highlight over here there is no list of arbitrator in the institution, mean as an institution, would tell you those are the good arbitrator who knows about environment. Then the parties need expert. So basically there is no list, developed list of expert who can help the parties to um, write reports about those dispute. This is the first challenge I have seen in the MENA region. And it's a procedural aspect that is hindering the growth of uh, arbitration. Second aspect, I think, which why people would go to litigation and not come to arbitration 
is measure and procedure to expedite early or urgent resolution. Considering the fast moving pace of scientific knowledge, innovation, and new technology involving climate change, urgency and timelessness and avoidance of delay is far matter and important for resolving such, such issues. So basically there is also due to potential environmental impact on the population if disputes are not dealt within fast manner and expedite manner. The institutional rules in Middle East does not have this feature of expedite manner, which help the parties to come to, uh, to, uh, to get uh, injunction or to get uh, uh, order, quick order from, from the courts. But they get this court orders from the court. Those expedite manner are not there. For example, a regional arbitral institution should implement procedural rules that allow the parties and tribunal to adopt certain case management technique. For example, by verification of the proceeding, it means that to this divide the proceeding to certain part jurisdiction. And if there is a matter important and fast, the tribunal can do. That is not in the rule of the tri of, 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 um, of um, uh, institution. As well, allowing the party or tribunal to render partial award on key climate related scientific or technical or other specialized issues or other specialized issue to decide by solely on base of document. What is the problem is the process is long. So we need to do two things. One, allow the, the tribunal, first of all, to issue based on the documents and no need for oral, he oral hearing. Oral hearing, preparation for oral hearing, from my experience, it talks for two months or three months. And then there is a cost allocated by specifying the place. Then the party start to bring experts, fly the expert from London or Paris or US to come to the location. For example, if it's Dubai, they will fly. Then you will fly the expert. So it costs hundred thousand of dollars. One aspect and second aspect, it will cost the parties as well time. So basically we need to make a document based in order to have certain solution to be expedite mother. Another important issues, the procedural challenge that we see as a, as an arbitrator and as a council, application of climate change commitment or law. Arbitral tribunal usually bound by governing applicable laws and mandatory rules, which is party have agreed. If the parties agreed, the UE law will be applicable law, then he will apply the mandatory rules for procedural and he will apply substantive law of UAE. However, I would suggest that with the evolution of international and national law in developing climate change specific commitment and policy, tribunal are bound to give greater consider, consideration to such an instrument. On one notable, so basically an institution can, can put all of those laws to say if the dispute is, uh, is under UAE law, however, the tribunal has to implement and give priority or the tribunal might say, or the institution might say, those are transnational public policy that you are obliged to implement by looking to the dispute. So the problem, to summarize the problem, the issue is the tribunal is binded by national law. And when they apply the national law, they don't give any regard to international law. To resolve these problems, first of all, we can encourage the party to put in their clause, arbitration clause, that reference to those laws, or they can as well, the institution by itself put in the, in the procedure. For example, if you go to ICC, ICC would say it's implement the law of traders, Lex Marcator is part of the laws of ICC. If you didn't find the law, it's a filling gap for the law. So basically this is another important. Now the third or fourth important issue in a procedural aspect is increasing transparency. Why we should increase transparency in arbitration? It's a confidential manner, we don't need it. There is a public interest issue are frequently stake and climate related dispute. There is lack of transparency, it's evident nationally, regionally and internationally when it comes to arbitration and related to climate 
uh, change. However, we have to understand those cases are have public interest, government interest. So it should be more transparent and we should learn from the experience. How we can then increase the transparency of arbitration? We can pre increase through opening proceeding to public, including publication of submission, procedural decision and hearing. Publication is very important. For example, ICC started recently to publish certain awards by approval of the parties. So if certain award has been published, people will understand the important, public will be satisfied, and then we will have a support. And government will ensure that the public policy is not violated in this tribunal without their review. Now, another important element, fifth important procedural element, which I think within our institution, we don't have it, is the third party participation. The complex nation of climate change dispute may benefit from involvement of third parties, effective, affected citizen or population. As much expertise and transparency, any involvement by third party in the tribunal process require the express consent of the party. The problem, if you have arbitral dispute, you cannot involve third party. You have to go or otherwise your award will be null and void. Now we need to change the legislation to allow the tribunal to put third affected party. Or if somebody wants to be joining this proceeding, he can join for the benefit of the public. Those are five elements which I think if we improved it in the Middle Eastern arbitral framework, we will have more arbitral dispute and we will improve the implementation on Montevideo video five. Now I would like to highlight some. Substantive issue, then Professor Domilio, I will close my session will open. So substantive challenge, what is the substantive challenge? The environmental protection from my perspective is obligation is emanated from Sharia itself, which signifies source, which is important source of law in all Middle Eastern country. Either it's a, it's a primary source or the chief source of the legislation of Middle East. And it's a filling gap. It filled the gap when there is no local legislation. Under Sharia, every man has duty to protect the environment and not to take up of advantage was given to them by God. Sharia law consider a man an earthborn creature and uh, and vestrant, vestrant of God on earth. Sustainable development is key principle under Sharia law, where Quran has encouraged and instructed mankind to approach environment rationally and with care. Then what is the problem in our substantive law? The problem with the substantive law of GCC countries and Arab country generally, the scope of arbitrable matter is a very wide and big. So basically in some jurisdiction, because certain principle comes from law, from international law, they consider it as a public policy. And if they consider it as a public policy, the danger is that they don't allow those matter to go to arbitration. And they believe that the local court has to review that. And, 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 and this is generally my point of view. Arbitrability is a big issue for us. Uh, many challenge comes with the court because court views these issues as a matter of public policy. So it should go to the court, not to go uh, to, the, to arbitration. So it's not arbitrable matter. So what I believe, I believe we need to reinvent and re-review the definition of what is arbitrable matter. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. And I think hopefully I was short to the point. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoud, for that very, very practical and insightful uh, presentation. I think you, you traced the relationship between um, achieving some of the goals of Montevideo 5 and you know, ensuring that we have um, a timely and accessible uh, mechanism for resolving environmental disputes. And you know, I like the way you set it out by talking about you know, the, you know, why litigation might not be that timely, accessible, you know, and even affordable mechanism for resolving uh, uh, new forms of environmental dispute, especially climate change related uh, disputes. So, um, you know, avoiding delays, ensuring timeliness, given the nature of climate change problems will be very key if the world is to achieve some of the uh, 
net zero ambitions that everyone is setting this day. And, and, I, and I like the fact that you, you, you began to trace the challenges. Why is it that we don't use arbitration? Why is it that arbitration is hardly mentioned when it comes to uh, you know, access to justice for the, for the, for the public? Um, like you mentioned the fact that most times, lack of an arbitration clause is a key issue in which you have a number of agreements that do not clearly integrate. And of course, arbitration is based on party autonomy. If you don't say you want to, you want arbitration, then that, may, that means you're excluding it. So, and, and I think the five elements and the five principles you identified will be very, very crucial, especially the need for clearer legislation, uh, you, you know, that integrate arbitration and alternative dispute resolution as a way for accelerating progress on climate change. Well, that's just a wonderful perspective to bring in into this debate. And I'm sure that um, the UNEP will be uh, at the exact forefront of integrating arbitration more clearly as we seek to uh, resolve climate change related disputes. Thank you so much. Well, we'll move to the last speaker, last but certainly not the least will be Dr. Aziz Amonia. Uh, before we move on, I want to remind you that you can put in your questions in the chat box and we'll answer them. I already see one question there for Dr. Christina and another question for Professor Riyadh. So I hope the speakers can read those questions. And then after this last presentation, we'll get back to each of you to answer them. So Dr. Aziza, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank you for this kind invitation. I'm really honored um, and happy being introduced uh, to such incredible research and practitioner community. And I guess it's a very important opportunity to tease out like interesting aspects of environmental law and how environmental law can contribute to achieving sustainability and sustainability practices in, in our region, in the MENA region. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, start my presentation or my talk talking about the Montevideo um, environmental law program, its vision and objective, and the main achievements that it has succeeded to achieve till now. Uh, the Montevideo environmental law program guides uh, identification and implementation of priority action in environmental law to be undertaken by the United Nations environmental program in partnership with key stakeholders. Here I will call the vision of the program. The program supports the development and implementation of environmental rule of law, strengthen the related capacities in countries and contributes to the environmental dimension of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. In order to achieve this like Promising vision, the Montevideo Environmental Law Program has been taking under, has been undertaking a number of activities, including, for example, providing practical guidance, effective law models and approaches, as well as best practices and models indicators to participating countries. Um, also, the program focuses on developing and promoting information and data exchange among legal stakeholders involved in the development and implementation of environmental law. Uh, promoting public participation, access to information and access to justice in environmental matters, promoting the recognition of the mutually reinforcing relationship between environmental law and the three pillars of the Charter of the United Nations, and also supporting environmental law awareness raising and encouraging research, including studies and reports on emerging environmental issues and causes in, the, in different regions in the world. Uh, one major achievement of the previous Montevideo environmental law program, including um, the enablement of many countries to open new frontiers of adjudication on environmental rights, uh, and also contribution to the adoption of the regional agreement on access to information, public participation on justice in environmental matter matters in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, this agreement is presented as one of the most important human rights agreements in the last 20 years. This like few examples of the achievements of the previous Montevideo programs uh, that took place in the last few uh, years. Uh, given this like promising and interesting vision of the program and like the important role that it has been playing along the last few years, why such program is very important in the MENA region? I would like to answer these questions, pinpointing the main, the main environmental challenges that taking place now in our region and gives like very important, a very important val value to Montevideo 
uh, environmental law program. Um, first of all, the MENA region has been identified as a climate change hotspot by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, given the expected severe and intense droughts coupled with uh, sea level rise and reduction in participation in Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, and Tunisia, between 50 and 30, 350 million people in the region will experience increases in water stress. In addition, climate change, jointly with other drivers such as, such as population growth, urbanization, and economic changes, will cause crop failures and consequently large-scale disruption of food system in the MENA region. For example, in Egypt, water supply per capita has dropped 60% since 1970, and by 2025, the UN expects Egypt to face absolute water scarcity with 100 million people exposed in the, uh, in the region. These environmental challenges have been further aggravated by other social economic processes which characterize the MENA region and include the huge population growth, rapid urbanization process, and the high rate of poverty. In this context, it seems that every time governments in our region are faced with a choice between with a choice between economic development and jobs on the one hand and the protection of environment on the other hand priority is always given to the former which is economic growth or economic development at the expense of environmental protection the second challenge in our region is that <clears throat> is linked to that many natural resources in our region are linked together uh, however, there are few transboundary agreements on the use and management of shared natural resources. One clear example here is water resources. The problem is even made worse by population increase, policies that subsidize the cost of water rather than encouraging effective use, and a warming and a drying climate. Examples of tensions over water resources include the conflict between Turkey and downstream Iraq and Syria over the Euphrates and Tigris River, Israel control on the availability of water to Palestinians, conflict between Egypt and Ethiopia over water allocation and disagreements over technical construction of the Grand Renaissance Ethiopian Dam. The third challenge in the MENA region <clears throat> is the fact that the MENA region environmental challenges are locked in a global setting, in the sense that uh, its growing food importers are vulnerable to any um, like instability in the production uh, prices and supply chain that could aggravate the food security situation in the region. Case studies include Egypt and Syria, where rising food prices in 2008 were partially triggered by climate change-induced harvest failure in major producing countries and led to unrest and aggravated public discontent that preceded the Arab uprising in 2011. For example, Egypt, which is a net wheat importer, experienced a 300% increase in the price of bread in 2010. Global wheat prices rose due to droughts in China and heat waves in Russia, which devastated harvests. In Syria, it's another example where uh, food insecurity took place before the civil conflict in Syria due to the extreme droughts that took place back in 2007 till 2010, where, um, where like 75% 75, 75 of the most vulnerable farmers um, had to migrate from the rural area to the urban places. Another challenge in the MENA region is that, that countries that have some success in dealing with environmental and climate challenges have made them political priorities in a way that guide legal framework, legal reforms, the implementation of multilateral environmental agreements in national legislation and the integrated decision making across government, department and institution. Examples here include Tunisia, where climate change is inscribed in the 2014 constitution. In particular, the Article 45 in the Tunisian constitution states that the state guarantees the right to a healthy and a balanced environment and the right to participate in the protection of the climate. 
Morocco and Jordan also have ambitious climate and water plans. Um, however, like they have like some kind of moderate success in this regard. Another challenge in the region is that the region is home to the worst ongoing humanitarian conflicts such as the war in Libya, the civil conflict in Syria, the war in Yemen, poverty is increasing in the region and this increase is largely associated with, this, with these ongoing conflicts. As always, it is the poorest, most marginalized and unprotected who suffer the most from the interlinked environmental crisis. While literature and previous studies have evolved to address the human cost and um, the economic cost of war and conflict, However, the environment remained a silent victim, standing only on the sidelines of impact analysis. The United Environmental Program, UNEP, seminal, re seminal report on protecting the environment during armed conflict, analysis 20 post-conflict environmental assessment to show that there is like a very uh, negative effects of war and conflict on the environment. Therefore, there is a pressing need to conceptually link environmental impacts within the legal and human rights framework in our region. And I guess that um, the Montevideo Environmental Law Program aims to achieve this important goal. Another challenge in our region is that in an era when climate change law and policy are shaped through mainly nationally self-determined commitments, countries in the MENA region have been lagging. Legal reforms and policy making towards increasing the share of renewable within the energy mix and national incomes have shown some progress in the, few, in the past few years. These shifts may be significant given the fact that the region relies heavily on fossil fuel revenues. But when viewed against a larger backdrop of reduction of global emission to two degrees, these efforts still fall short by a fair margin. Analysis of the current emission policies and laws on the global efforts towards the Paris Agreement's goal include only three countries from the region, Morocco, UAE and Saudi Arabia. The intended nationally determined contribution of both the UAE and Saudi Arabia have been ranked as inadequate, while Morocco has been ranked as only sufficient. Given the above mentioned environmental challenges in the MENA region, I guess this kind of intergovernmental program on promoting and implementing environmental rule of law in the MENA region under the Montevideo program is very important and central to sustainable development. It integrates environmental needs with, with the essential elements of the rule of law and provide the basis for improving environmental governance. It highlights environmental sustainability by connecting connecting it with fundamental rights and obligations. It reflects universal moral values and ethics, ethical norms of behavior, and it provides a foundation for environmental rights and obligation. Without such kind of programs, environmental governance may be arbitrary, that is environmental governance or environmental sustainability will not be achieved in our region where there is like a huge environmental challenges in the region. Um, another important thing I would like to highlight is that um, in the wake of the Arab uprising, we can see that environmental issues have come to the forefront of the public sphere in the region with a plenty of environmental movements, including Egyptian against coal in Egypt, no fossil gas fracking in Algeria, and also we are not trash in Morocco, and you stink movement in Lebanon. All these environmental movements are clear examples that environmental sustainability and environmental rights is not a luxury anymore. It is very essential and it has become a real concern for the lay citizens. However, when we lock on the ground we can see like um very little change in the broader policy making and in the in the legal frameworks in our region and still 
as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, when it comes to a choice between economic development or environmental protection, usually economic development and um, economic growth win. Uh, by this, I end my talk and I'm looking forward to your question and thank you once more for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Aziza, for that very detailed and very insightful presentation. I think you set out the problems very clearly. Um, due to the geographical um, challenges of the region, especially being an arid region, there, there's a lot of um, you know, environmental issues that come with that. And there, 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 there are a lot of um, concerns and problems, uh, disasters as well that come with that. So there is an increasing need for all uh, MENA countries to have resilience frameworks that address these problems. Um, but of course, you notice that due to pre-existing economic challenges in different parts of the region as well, there's a tendency to place economic problems ahead of environmental problems. Uh, and you, you make a very clear point, which is that, you know, both are not inseparable. Both are actually interlinked. And there is no way you can achieve economic growth without sustainability without environmental considerations because um, if you build the best infrastructure in the world that if they are not climate smart if they are not resilient then they can easily collapse and all the money that has been spent on such infrastructure will be a waste so i like the point that you made that there is a need for integration then there's a need to connect um, economic objectives with environmental objectives and of course even infusing human right provisions, gender justice, and, and the likes into those frameworks. I think those are all very viable points. And I like the fact that you highlight how the Montevideo 5 program can help um, MENA countries to achieve that integration of sustainability objectives, environmental objectives into um, the ambitious economic development plan. So thank you very, very much for this. I think you've, you've given us a lot to, to think about and, and, and all the speakers have done exactly that. So uh, I really, really appreciate the efforts put into these presentations. And I think I see a lot of questions uh, uh, in the chat room. So let's, let's take the, the very first one, uh, which is to uh, the, you know, Dr. Christina, how can we partner as a group in the implementation of some of this legal principles that you set out, especially those related to pollution control, uh, dis uh, disaster management resilience. How can we advance cooperation in the region, cooperation between countries, cooperation between universities, cooperation between uh, stakeholders in the business sector? How can we achieve that greater cooperation? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, definitely, like uh, working collectively is usually more efficient because like this will enlighten each government and each country to check where are the gaps, where are the weaknesses, where are the strong points and to enhance and work to enhance. And as I mentioned, like how it's going to be worked collectively, this is the role of the UNEP Montevideo program and the role of the UNEP that is the, the large umbrella that brings States together and governments together and involve stakeholders. And then there should be a work among each country on its own to do like this homework, to do this benchmarking of their mainly of their environmental law, to do this gap analysis uh, in respect in comparison with the MENA countries environment law. Uh, this is very important and useful exercise to be done, like to put in a table what are uh, each pillars that are found in each country as per this environmental law and then take another country in the MENA and check. And from here, you will have it visually. What are missing? What are the points that are kind of uh, need to be enhanced? What should be like, for example, to be uh, added, to be removed? And this is very important. And then from there, when each country does this homework alone, there could be collective meetings to discuss further the challenges of the implementation. Because, Professor, it's like very important to put the legislation and to put the legal framework, but the most uh, challenging part is the rule of law and the implementation, the sanctions and the incentives. And this is, this is the main challenge remains, like how to promote for better implementation this remains the biggest challenge for all countries and not only in the MENA. So how come when it comes just to the MENA with all these challenges and all these kind of outsources uh, uh, found? So uh, yeah, working collectively, I, I find it very, very important, uh, Professor. 
Maybe, Professor, I can add something to my colleague, uh, Christiana. Christiana. Please go ahead. Sorry. So what I think as well, along with what she said, the gap analysis is important of gap analysis uh, and socio impacts and other impact uh, analysis. One thing I think, and I'm speaking about some GCC countries, I don't know about other jurisdiction, but the thing is, I think in GCC, what we miss is the consultation paper. We don't have a term of consultation paper, and even the law, they doesn't go for consultation uh, period where public come and comment on the law and give their feedback. So there is a, this is a gap between the government and private sectors. And if you know, the private sectors is a catalyst for this environment, and they care because they are the first people to be impacted. Now, they want to consult, they want to put, but there is no opportunity for them to, to really give their feedback. And one way I think the improvement should be the consultation paper has to be, or the law has to be put to the public uh, feedback. And that we lack in this jurisdiction. And it's a lot of improvement because private sector has a lot of, they can lobby for it, they can give a good feedback. They can give you their experience. Now, for example, and, 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 and recently they are working an amendment of Dubai International Arbitration Center. It's the largest in Arab words, but there were no consultation process. So the practitioner like me, if they would be there, they would get more feedback about how to improve the arbitration mechanism framework for our, for for to attract more climate related issues to come to arbitration. So this is to add from what uh, Dr. Christina has said. Yeah, I agree. And this is very important, like, um, um, because I mentioned like a private sector has a main role when it comes to financing and the mechanisms of finance. This is very important pillar and the role of civil societies that foster these public awareness and the transparency and good governance. So. Public consultation also is the second layer pillar. And I agree, uh, Dr. Mahmoud, this is very important. It should be posted online. It should be given a grace period for public to comment. And then uh, it is very important that the government integrate these comments, not like just giving this. And this is also important. Like we suffer from it in our country. Uh, they put it, for example, if they give the chance to put it for public, then they don't integrate the comments. Or on the contrary, sometimes they uh, 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 worsen it. So this is very important uh, also up into public consultation. But working like uh, benefiting from experiences of uh, others also, this is very important because people think sometimes and government think that the law is rigid. No, law is not rigid. Law is, should be continuously uh, a change to adapt to new technologies, to new crises, to new challenges. So from time to time, we should go revisit our laws and modify them. Thank you very much uh, for the very brilliant answers, Dr. Christina and uh, Dr. Hussein. Well, the, there are other questions here, and I'll, I'll take the, the other one first for Professor Riyadh, but I can see that Dr. Mahmoud, you have two or three questions waiting for you. So please read them and I'll come back to them. Professor Riyadh, there's a question here for you on the need for policy and legislative coherence, you, you, which you talk, talked about. And, 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 and the, the, the question here is that it seems the SDGs themselves are created, uh, it says one of the critiques of the SDGs is the tendency to treat the environment as 17 different silos instead of an integrated and unitary domain. So I guess the question is, does the SDG, I mean, do the SDGs really help us to achieve this coherence that you're talking about? And how can we implement environmental laws in such a way that will make us achieve progress in all the SDGs as a whole? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Very interesting uh, question. So uh, see, uh, uh, briefly, I think that the problems posed by the legal and institutional aspects in uh, delaying with the, the issue of environmental protection, uh, I think they pose a great challenge in which politics interveners strongly, uh, whether at the local or international levels, uh, and uh, or, uh, as well as uh, what is primarily economic, in order to preserve some interests that cannot be preserved without harming the uh, environment. Therefore, I think 
uh, creating harmony and uh, uh, between what is legal and what is institutional uh, in the protection of the environment pass through what is political and economic and require the presence of a strong political, uh, human and developmental uh, will that cares about protecting the human being, his environment and development above all is. Is that what I think about uh, this uh, dear friend, Damilula? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Riyad, for that uh, wonderful answer. And I and I see we'll move over to to, to the next two questions. Unless uh, anyone has something to add to that uh, um, to that point. Uh, if not, we'll move to the next two questions to Dr. Mahmoud. First, there is a question here, Dr. Mahmoud. While arbitration should be pursued before or in addition to litigation, does it not assume that the parties have equal powers under the law? If, if nature does not have legal standing before the law, who has the right to intervene in the voice of nature in arbitration cases? So of course, I think that deals with the debate about, so if there is a, if there is a problem with trees, who is going to represent uh, trees in, in an, an arbitration case, which is, the, which is one of the key issues we have in litigation as well. So that's the first question. And I see here, the second question is about how to balance the confidentiality provisions with the need for disclosure and transparency, uh, which, which is always, again, a key issue, whether in arbitration or in litigation. So over to you. Uh, you are the expert, so I'll leave it to you, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you very much. And I think I think what happened in recent development in the years, we have seen a lot, of, a lot of criticism to arbitration, to the institution for lack of disclosure, because always public has interest to know, particularly when it comes case to environmental case. And now you are building the knowledge how are you going to bend the knowledge within this area of practice if other practitioners cannot see awards? We cannot see the awards. We cannot see how they dealt with it because it's a knowledge. So accumulated knowledge. Now, ICC started recently to do certain case, not environmental, but certain case to open it for the public so public can see it. Uh, Sometimes they remove certain sensitive information and they can put it. So basically, the principle will be established. And when you come to the principle of international law, uh, you see a lot of, for example, exit disclose all of their judgment and all of that. You can read them and all of that. Because of this disclosure principle of exit, a lot of international law principle has been evolved. Because those arbitrators are professors, those people are knowledgeable, they have 40 years of experience. So basically evolve. So what I said, I said the rules has to, ch to be start changing. The environmental matter has to actually be open for 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 uh, for certain environmental issues, or uh, to, award has to be published. So what I mean, I don't, I'm not pro opening the whole um, um, uh, uh, discussion or debate within the tribunal because it's a very difficult for you as a tribunal because you don't have the power of the judge to bring contempt of the courts or whatever. So basically, I think it should be confidential, the proceeding. However, the award has to be uh, open, has to be disclosed to the party so we learn from it. Now, this is one, and it's a very, very important thing if you want to develop this area of arbitration. Now, another thing, I think, I think one of the important things which was highlighted by Peter, I think the problematic issue in uh, if there is a litigation in the courts, you could interfere if you have interest or you, ha you have interest. But however, this is not because, because there is a party autonomy in arbitration and people are binded by the signatory are binded. And if you intervene somebody third party, the, the award will be null and void by the courts. I think it's a time for us to review what really we are doing in the law. It's not helpful for certain cases environmental. We need to exempt them. So the national law has to look and, and change and amend and say there is interference and there is, should be disclosure and openness when it comes dispute related to environment. Fantastic. Uh, uh, I think uh, you, you've covered the two questions very well. Um, I'm, I'm gonna take one uh, question for Dr. Aziza here. And um, I see another question has just popped up for Dr. Mahmoud. I will come back to that. 
Um, um, Dr. Agisa, you know, the, the MENA region has one of the largest youth population in the world. And there is a question on how we can use that as an advantage to mobilize and ensure awareness on environmental issues. How can MENA countries increase awareness among the youth on environmental issues and uh, environmentally conscious lifestyles? I think you're muted. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question, very interesting question. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, the youth uh, is playing a very important role in environmental um, activism, for example. Um, and um, as I mentioned, like what happened in the Arab region back in 2011 cannot only describe as a political uh, mobilization, it could be also that the Arab uprising can be described as like green spring in the sense that the young people and the lay citizen have become aware of the environmental issues in the region and they are pursuing their environmental rights in order to do so they like organizing the uh, symbol is like in a coalition and also they play a very active role in the civil society um, and we can say that the arab uprising was not about organized or formal organization it was about informal organization which mainly formed from young people and youth who played very important role in using like um, uh, their savvy and like um, technological skills in order to organize and communicate and like uh, organize protests or sit ins um, and um, their voice heard this is not only in political issues, but also in environmental issues. And we have like plenty of examples of environmental groups, for example, in Egypt and in Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia. For example, in Lebanon, we have um, the youth tank movement that was led by young people and resulted in uh, forming a political party that ran uh, in the municipal elections. And although it, it didn't, the, the political, this new, uh, newly established political party didn't win in the municipal election. However, they managed to um, get like a public support somehow, uh, given the lim their limited resources and limited financial resources or like uh, political organization. However, they managed to make their voice heard. Um, there are other examples for environmental mobilization where the young people played a very important role, like um, Egyptian against coal in Egypt. Um, and also, um, the young people played uh, a very important role in legislation, environmental legislation, because we have in Egypt um, an environmental organization called Habi Center for Environmental Rights, where young Egyptian lawyer managed to file a case against large cement factories like Lavarge in Egypt, uh, suing them because the, uh, the, the cement factories um, resulted in like bad and negative environmental impacts on the workers in the cement factories and also in the local people. And this law case, uh, this like uh, lawsuits were filed by young Egyptian uh, lawyers. Um, other examples of like how the youth can contribute to environmental pr protection or environmental sustainability uh, can be through um, public awareness and uh, uh, encouraging the young people to know more about environmental issues and how they contribute to environmental protection. In this regard, me, myself, as a uh, university professor, I organized like several um, environmental awareness campaigns, including uh, young people and school students in order to raise their public awareness about environmental issues and try to communicate uh, complicated um, scientific concepts in a very simple way through what is called environmental education in order to contribute to building their environmental citizenship. Uh, and, uh, and in order to be an environmental citizen, you don't need to do like major changes. You can do like slight or um, um, small steps that make like incremental changes. Uh, for example, if you try to uh, take your bike instead of your car to the university, if you try to like turn off the light in your room, uh, if you try to like use less water during showering or 
uh, and some kind of all these examples of small steps that make like incremental changes. So yeah, this is like some examples of how young people can involve it in environmental uh, protection efforts and be more like educated about what happens in our planets, in our planet. It's only one planet. <laughs> Fantastic, Dr. Aziza. Yes, one planet. And I, I totally agree. It's all about behavioral change. And that's something that is increasingly emphasized here in Qatar. For example, the Qatar Foundation recently organized, a, you know, a car-free day in which the entire <laughs> campus, you know, were to walk around. Some of us uh, lost some weight just doing that and um, became <laughs> used to it. And, and it's something that we now look forward to. So it's, it's uh, initiatives like that, car-free day, using um, you know containers instead of uh, instead of buying uh, plastics mm -hmm. and all of that these are things that um, all countries yeah. in the region can continue to improve upon we have just about um, 10 minutes left to go so i will uh, there's another question which i'll ask dr mahmoud after which i will uh, go around the panel and ask that you give your uh, closing remarks uh, so that we wrap up so but we we'll take this um, final question for Dr. Mahmoud, which says, um, what are the role of ICC plan on the environment uh, uh, rather than lobbying and advocacy? Are you still a member of the ICC as we are? Uh, well, I think uh, you understand the question. Um, talking about the increasing, you know, what other things will the ICC do um, uh, um, in terms of um, environmental protection uh, and ensuring that um, it contributes to whether it's environmental awareness, training, and ensuring capacity building for environmental implementation in the region. I think uh, I'm a still member. I'm a board member of ICC UAE. I'm a vice president of the arbitration commission of ICC UAE. And as well, I'm a member of a commission of arbitration uh, of ICC. Uh, and, and I was part of the task force, actually one of the efforts, good efforts of uh, ICC started to address this matter. And ICC has done task force, when I was a member of the task force, to review and define what is environmental related dispute, to define what type of environment, and what we have to do as an ICC to improve the attractiveness of those mechanism in order for to attract more people to put the clauses. So, and then it comes with the outcome and recommendation. One of the recommendation was expedite manner for certain matter, so allowing the tribunal more flexibility to issue uh, partial award and technical issues. All of that that, that ICC has done. Then ICC has done another thing is which is expedite uh, proceeding. So basically party can agree on expedite proceeding. So basically you can put in your clause, expedite proceeding. However, I think ICC has done a lot in this regard. The problematic issue, as I said in my discussion, is from governmental issues because you need to change the law, which is give a big scope of arbitrable non arbitrability. So non arbitrable matter is a beyond in some jurisdiction like UAE, for example, anything can fit in a non arbitrable matter. So basically, you can put anything. Even the definition of public policy is so vague and broad that you can put anything in the words can be. It speak about international trade. Speak about the international dispute. So basically, the definition of in the public policy, which is strange, which is in our civil law, it's a very, very broad. So basically, from the governmental perspective, we need to as well to improve that. Now, the institution and GCC, the institution is really laid back. They don't have a, a, a custom-made framework to cut out those disputes. So basically, there is a lot of work, I say, in the region, on the government and an arbitral institution to change the rules to come, give expedite manner, and do a lot of things. So basically, that's from my perspective is, I think hopefully I, I addressed the question of role of ICC, International Chamber of Commerce. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoud. Well, so we will move to closing remarks, um, take home messages from each of our panelists. Uh, and, and of course, we start uh, with Dr. Christina after that. Uh, the Professor Riyadh, uh, then we have um, uh, Dr. Mahmoud and Dr. Aziza. Over to you, Dr. Christina. Thank you, Professor. Um, my closing remarks are like just 
governments react now, react now and move from kind of uh, goals and uh, from theoretical to practical, embark on immediate actions because uh, little by little things are becoming more complicated. Now we have this energy crisis that is hitting everywhere. We need to move, for example, and uh, work on this immediate emergency of sustainable energy, improve not only the goals, but the implementation. I try to adapt to all emergencies and enhance participation and good governance, work collectively together and benefit from all international organization support like UNEP and even others work collectively because united, these things uh, can be better to uh, fight all environmental crises and uh, 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 protect our uh, planet. Thank you. Professor Riyad. I think you're muted. You're muted. We can't hear you, please. Uh, now? Yes. And, OK. Yes. Uh, I think we must work locally to solve the problem of uh, uh, the multiplicity of laws and their overlap by creating a comprehensive code for all legal aspects uh, to protect the environmental in all its dimensions and levels. Uh, of course, uh, taking into account the uh, outcomes of the Montevideo program and the United Nations environmental program. Also, uh, I think that uh, a way must be sought to unify the efforts of the institutions concerned local, uh, locally with the protection of uh, the environment and to find a kind of harmony in their plurality and in their work in order to avoid overlapping and wasting resources uh, through the repetition of the same initiatives in reference also to the uh, output of Montevideo and the, the United Nations program. That's Thank you very much, Professor Riyad. Well, Dr. Mahmoud? I think what we need to do is start campaigning for greener arbitration, uh, a greener arbitration campaign for green arbitration. And I think we should start doing it because by having arbitration, uh, looking to this dispute, we solve a lot of uh, issues. We'll give the flexibility of arbitration. We'll get the fastness, expedite service, and, and as well, uh, so basically it will help us a lot to improve it and we will learn a lot through arbitration because as you know uh, professor arbitrator has time has expertise and they are in the field so basically their awards will be like guidance for us as well to learn a lot more than the court sometimes because court doesn't have they are packed with the, with the cases so we need the arbitration to do and for us to be more efficient in this area i think arbitration one of those important study issued by World Bank showed the countries who implemented arbitration system framework efficient has reduced the cost on the business. To reduce the cost on the business, we need to implement arbitration. And this is a study shows that implemented countries who were good in implementing arbitration, uh, they were more cost reduced 25% of the cost on the business. Why? Because the inefficiency of court will impact the parties. So we need to have to start campaigning for more green arbitration going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Aziza. Uh, I think you're muted. Sorry, you're muted. We couldn't hear, hear everything you've said. <laughs> Sorry. So my key message today is that I believe that environmental law should be a priority for policymakers and it shouldn't be uh, regarded, regarded as less important than uh, other types of laws. And also we should pay more attention as scholars and policymakers or practitioners to the interdisciplinary aspect of 
lawmaking in order to make use of different knowledges in order to help us rethink um, the different like um, culture, economic, social and political transformation that we need to undergo in order to address the, inter the complicated environmental crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, um, water, water scarcity and air pollution, all these like nagging and challenging environmental uh, challenges need to rethink the way our political economy, our economies and our political systems are formed and shaped and operating on the ground. Thank you. And thank you once more for having me. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I think um, you would agree that it's been a wonderful session. We've had very fantastic presentations. Uh, special thanks to our expert uh, panelists, the very best uh, of the region, Dr. Christina Abi Eida from Lebanon. Thank you, Professor Riyad Fakri from Morocco, and Dr. Mahmoud Zain from the United Arab Emirates, and Dr. Aziza Monier from Egypt. Um, you, you've given very wonderful presentations, food for thought. I see that a few questions are still popping in. Uh, there's another one for Dr. Mahmoud, uh, but of course we will encourage um, you to stay in touch with us. We will be happy to answer those questions. Uh, it's my pleasure on behalf of the Association of Environmental Law Lecturers in the Middle East and North African Universities, as well as on behalf of the College of Law at Ahmad bin Khalifa University. It's been a wonderful pleasure welcoming our expert speakers and, and participating in this important session. So we say shukran from all of us. And of course, if you want to stay in touch and if you, we're, we're gonna provide a summary of some of the things said today. So you can find that on our website, uh, Aselmo website. And of course you will be able to, you, you also, you can follow us on Twitter where you will get more about this event and other events of the association. Shukran, enjoy the rest of the day, bye-bye. Thank you so much, Demi Lola, and thank you so much to all of the speakers that we have had in this session. On behalf of UNEP, I gladly show my appreciation to all of you. So this brings us to the end of session five, and our next session will commence on the hour. So we are now going to take a short break before we come back to session six. Session six will move us towards Europe, and we are going to be looking at the role of environmental law to address the climate crisis and promote sustainable development. The next session will be hosted collaboratively with the World Commission on Environmental Law uh, Specialist Group on Climate Change. And so we are going to begin that session on the hour, wherever you are in the world, <laughs> towards the next hour. Um, between now and then, we are going to look back a little bit to Stockholm because we this whole event, this mammoth event of 24 hour celebration of environmental rule of law looks to not only the 40th anniversary of the Montevideo program, but 50 years since Stockholm and the sort of beginning of international environmental law and the 50 years that so much has been achieved. Uh, in the space of environmental rule of law. So we are now going to look at a quick video taking us back to Stockholm, and then we will see everyone uh, in about uh, 18 minutes for session six. Thank you once again. <laughs>